Stargate Voyager. Well, it is great to have Robert Edward Grant back for another episode. The author, inventor, uh, explorer, CEO, really so much more. Host of Gaia's Codex series. Robert, thanks for coming back for another interview. It's good to be here with you, Derek. Always, always happy to see you. Yeah, and I saw on USA Today's uh, one of their recent posts, you were included in one of their top uh, entrepreneurs for 2024. So big congrats. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was... Uh... I was uh, really humbled, I guess, to see that. And, you know, I think it was mainly for my work related to uh, building Orion, which is a really exciting new app that I just shared shared with you. And um, it's kind of a whole new paradigm in social media that, that doesn't exploit any of your data. Yeah, it's pretty incredible what you're showing me. And I'm really excited to get to jump in uh, Orion app and be a part of this. And and so I definitely also wanted to just tell you, thank you for your courage in uh, being a leading voice for free speech and all this data privacy and data security, because it's it's getting crazy out there, isn't it? Oh, man. You know, I think uh, there were already a lot of predictions on 2024 being kind of like a watershed year and watershed moment, right? Um, and I think we're definitely seeing that. We just had this eclipse. Uh, you know, we've got wars and rumors of wars. Um, in the Middle East and in, in Ukraine, but you know these are things that could easily conflate into something much more significant uh, around the globe. And um, we've never had a time where it's more important that we maintain both our individuation and our unique viewpoints on how we see the world. We need to speak up and, and say exactly how we feel and 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 play an active role in our future. Otherwise, you know, you know, things will just happen to you. I used to say, when I worked in the corporate world, I used to say there's three types of people. People, you know, some people make things happen. Other people watch things happen. And then there's a third group that wonders what the hell just happened. And you don't want to be in the third group. I think, right. I think sometimes it's okay to be a bit of a spectator on the sideline, but you also have to know when it's time for you to step up and take some risk and, and make a difference in the world. And, um, you know, I'm honored that I've had many opportunities to be able to be in that position uh, in different companies and different capacities and invention and all these different areas that you mentioned. But uh, I think if there were ever a time that the world needs your voice and all of our voices, it's now. The pace of discovery all around the world now is so fast. And it's not just, you know, our team. It's people like yourself and others. We're all waking up to this and and everyone is playing a part in this. This is not just, you know, one group. And I don't believe that, that this age is meant to be consolidated around one leader or something. I just don't. I think that this is supposed to be an age of sovereignty where everybody gets to be a leader, but no one has to be the leader. The age of overlords and that what that represents is over. And I gave a speech at the United Nations. You can imagine, they let me speak at this place, right? Oh, wow. The last two years. And I got up and literally said, how many of you think the, the earth still needs overlords? And I'm speaking to a group full of overlords. That's fascinating that you, you, got, you got to say that kind of stuff to the United Nations. I said it to the Vatican. I spoke twice last year at the Vatican. I'm speaking there again in a month. I'm getting knighted by the country of Portugal and by Italy. I was already knighted by Montenegro. So... I'm like, I'm in a, such a unique position where I get to stand at the intersection between two disparate worlds entirely. My own experience with censorship, and uh, it seems like it's getting worse and worse. It's awesome that there's uh, new inventions, new uh, technologies and apps like you're creating with Orion to get us the ability to think the way we want to think and speak the way we want to speak. So I'm really excited to dive into that. And I've really enjoyed following you, Robert, man, the last handful of years since I first heard about that discovery you made inside the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid with the Alpha and Omega symbols. And so I started, that really caught my attention. And then we did an interview that was uh, a couple of years ago was great. And then since then, you've made several trips back to Egypt. And then I've been enjoying your research and the, your postings regarding cymatics and sound resonance, geometry. So there's so much to talk about. Um, and I know you've been making some new discoveries lately inside the King's Chamber. So I'll kind of let you start this out wherever you want to take it. Um, what do you want to share with us? 
the original name of Egypt, that area, was not Cairo. It was Babylon. So if you go back and look at maps from the time of Jesus Christ, you'll find that there was no Cairo around at that time. There was Heliopolis, right? And there was this Mahdi, which you know means calendar. It's directly east of the pyramid complex, across you know, right across the uh, the uh, the Nile River. And actually, when I was in Florence not too long ago, I found a map on the wall in a Galileo Museum. Right, so the Galileo Museum has a big map in there, and it's called the Fra Mauro map. It's actually a facsimile copy. It's like a very, very highly detailed, perfected copy of another map. Uh, that's in another location, but it's the same map, and it shows the world in 1457. And what's interesting is that when you look at the area around Egypt, and it shows it from if you're like looking down on the world from you know the top of say Europe, and you look down, you would see the Mediterranean, you see Italy and the boot, and you would see Greece, and then if you go a little bit towards the north on the map, even though it's not north in our orientation, it's the way it was oriented on the map. You see Egypt, and it doesn't mention the name Nile River on the Nile River. The name it gives to the Nile River is Gihon, which you might remember from the Bible, because in the Bible, the place of the Garden of Eden is where the four rivers meet, right? So the four rivers were purportedly the Tigris, Euphrates, the Pishon, and the Gihon rivers, right? Right. Now, if you go back to history with Herodotus, the great scholar, right, as well as the scholar uh, Josephus, they both said that the Gihon River was the Nile. So how it became the Nile, it only becomes the Nile when you get down well past, you know, deep into Sudan area. But all the way into that area, from what we would consider the northern part of Egypt, or what we call Lower Egypt, all the way to Upper Egypt, was the Nile was called the Gihon River. And Gihon is a reference to gushing water. So gushing water, and this is all a reference as well to the, the son and the grandson of Noah from the Bible. So you remember that Noah had a son named Ham, right? And the son of Ham was Cush, said to be the leader of the Cushite people that eventually got control of all of Egypt. So they were down in the Sudan area, and the Kushite people include what we would consider modern-day Somalia, Ethiopia, and, um, and all the way, of course, into Sudan and southern Egypt. And these people, the Kushite people, were black people. And they, um, they got control of most of what we consider Egypt today, right? So these would be the black pharaohs. You probably heard about this when you were down in Egypt, probably around the Valley of the Kings area. This, you know, Muhammad talks about this a lot, mm -hmm. who I know you work closely with. But what's most interesting about this is that he had a son, Cush had a son, who became a great ruler, and his son's name was Nimrod. Nimrod is famous in the Bible for building the Tower of Babel. Right. Okay. Now, the Tower of Babel was supposed to have been built on the shores or the banks of the river Gihon. Okay, now we today believe that Babylon was located in what we would consider, you know, Mesopotamia, in the Fertile Crescent. But we never found the city. Archaeologists never found the city. And there's great debate on where Babylon actually was. Well, the funny part is, is that when you look at Leonardo da Vinci's letter to the sultan, to the De Devetdar of the sultan of Cairo, it actually says to the Devetdar of the Sultan of Babylon, Cairo. Because this whole area next to Calendar is Old Cairo, and the name of Old Cairo was Babylon. So now we have the Tower of Babel was built by a Cushite by the name of Nimrod who wanted to be like God. And so my research, and I'm actually presenting this uh, this later this summer at the uh, the ancient civilizations conference for Gaia on the con on this whole concept of the Tower of Babel, and so I had very recent discoveries related to this, 
And I believe that the Tower of Babel plateau was actually in Egypt. And it's actually a place called Abu Rawash today. Oh, okay. You didn't expect to hear anything about this, did you? No. Okay. So I have not talked about this on any podcast yet. Um, I made some brief references to it on a podcast I did with 19 Keys. But this is really fascinating because about eight kilometers north of the Giza Plateau is the plateau that's the highest in the whole area. It stands 300 feet higher elevation than the Giza Plateau. These are the most northern pyramids in all of Egypt. Right? There are no more north, more north pyramids than, than this in all of Egypt. And you could think of the Nile or this ancient Gihon River that means gushing, like Kush people. And there were never Kushite people in Mesopotamia. So why they ever believed it was Mesopotamia doesn't make any sense. You'd have to cross the entire Saudi Arabian Peninsula and get all the way into Mesopotamia. That's a long, long way from Ethiopia and Somalia and Sudan, where the Kushite people were from. Hmm. Right? But you can get the 800 kilometers north to get to Giza. It's not that far to go from Luxor or Aswan to get up to Giza. Not so far at all. But, and if you look at it, you know, the story of the Tower of Babel is that the building was supposed to be the largest building ever, right? It was supposed to be this super tall building that somehow the uh, builder of it, Nimrod, who's also known as Orion, right? Because he's represented by the constellation Orion. Um, that this, this building, you know, and he wanted to become like God. So he was going to build a building that would reach high into the heavens. Well, interestingly, uh, God wasn't happy, apparently, as the story goes, and destroyed the building, right? And then at the same time, confounded the languages because what, you know, it's kind of like the same thing right after Genesis where God says, okay, um, Adam ate of the knowledge of the tree of uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so uh, lest he reach out and eat now the tree of life, the other tree in the Garden of Eden, let's put cherubim and a flaming sword to protect the way so that Adam will stay away from this tree, the tree of life. Because if he does eat it, then he'll live forever, right, in his sinly state. Well, with the Tower of Babel, the gods, the Elohim, they said, oh, we don't like that this guy Nimrod's building this tower up to heaven. You know, maybe he thinks he could be great like us. And so they apparently not only destroyed the uh, the tower, but also uh, confounded the languages, because until that time, there was only one language on earth. We don't know if that was telepathy or what, you know. And, and so basically, um, the Tower of Babel was supposedly destroyed. Well, if you go to Abu Rawash today, that platform stands 300 feet higher than where you would stand on the Giza Plateau. And you could see it. It's only 8,000 meters away. That's not that far, five kilometers, right? We could see off in the distance pretty easily, especially in that area, probably like 25 to 30 miles, right, in the distance, even though they've got some pollution and haze and everything. But this is exactly northwest of the Great Pyramid Complex, and it's right off the corner of the Great Pyramid. So you just go directly northwest, and it's immediately across from this place that is called Babylon. That's the part of Cairo today called Babylon. And there are two pyramids there. The first pyramid is the larger of the two, and it has a 60-degree slope angle. Now, these pyramids were destroyed. Nobody knows how they were destroyed. There's about 20 concourses still uh, there, and there's a gigantic deep cavern or pit. It looks as though the pyramid exploded from the inside out. The outer casing stone was all rose granite. So only the Menkari pyramid on the Giza Plateau has a granite casing right along the base, but it's not all the way up. This pyramid had an entire granite casing. So that's not easy to build a casing stone all out of granite. And it would be very expensive because this was a particular type of granite called rose granite, 55% quartz crystal. So you could say this is literally a quartz crystal pyramid. It's the same material that the sarcophagus is made out of in the king's chamber, where only the sarcophagus is made out of that. There are small segments that are also rose granite inside of the, you know, the antechamber, for example. So you get the better resonance in the antechamber, 
that little crawl space that you step up into and then you just ohm and it's like wow super powerful right the resonance is incredible that's, that's the most fascinating one of the most fascinating parts of the whole pyramid is that little chamber that little chamber is one of my favorite places to be because it's got even stronger resonance than the sarcophagus right and it's like you're walking into a sci-fi futuristic movie it's like a cleansing before you go into the king's chamber right it like washes you with the this vibration that like it's so powerful well basically if you look at the abu wash plateau the two pyramids the one that had the 60 degree slope angle which is an equilateral triangle so it's literally shaped like the equilateral triangle uh, is called the jed Ephraim pyramid today the reason they called it the jed Ephraim pyramid is because there was a large pit next to the pyramid that they thought may at one time have housed a solar boat. And because there's a solar boat that they believe was placed by Jed Efray, right, who was the grandson of, uh, of uh, Khufu, right, uh, great-grandson of Khufu, then you would have a the same type of thing, right? So there must be some solar boat there. So maybe Jed Efray built this pyramid north of the Giza Plateau. So, but I actually have a different thesis. Jed is a reference to raising the Jed, the Jed pillar, which you probably also heard of in the Wajets, you know, the Waz scepter, right? It's raising the Jed is taking the energy up the spine, the Kundalini, to awaken all of the energetic centers in the body. What's interesting about this is maybe they called it the Jed Ephraim Pyramid simply because historically it was always called the Jed. Right, it was always called the Jed area. That whole area was was known as the Jed pyramid. In addition to that, there's a smaller pyramid that's immediately uh, angled to diagonally from this pyramid, so corner to corner, and they're very close together. This pyramid has a very steep slope angle of sixty seven point three eight degrees. It happens to be the identical same pyramid as the one on the dollar bill on the Great Seal of the dollar bill. So imagine the dollar bill with the eye of providence on it. It's the exact same pyramid shape. And in fact, the first five concourses have the exact same number of blocks as the one on the dollar bill. And the rest are gone because the pyramid also exploded. Right. Now, the, the rose granite casing stones are littered hundreds of meters all around this pyramid. So you've got two pyramids that represented very significantly in Esoterica, the Philosopher's Stone. So there are two references that we have Philosopher's Stone. You've seen the equilateral triangle version, which has a circle and a square, right? So you've got a square that's inscribed inside of the equilateral triangle. Then you have a circle inside that square. I'm sure you've seen this before. That's called the Philosopher's Stone reference. But there's a second Philosopher's Stone that also got prominence because of a fellow in the 17th century by the name of uh, Meyer, Michael Meyer. And he made this version of it where it shows this guy with a giant compass standing in front of a wall and a man and woman standing inside of the circle in the square. And the angle on the pyramid is very different. The pyramid angle is 67.38 degrees. So it's not a uh, equilateral triangle. It's a 512-13 triangle. So 512-13 is a Pythagorean triple that's unique because it's the only one, the only triangle that has the same perimeter as its area. So 5 plus 12 plus 13 equals 30, right? And then if you take 5 uh, and you multiply it by 12, it equals 60 and take one half of that to find the area, then you would have 30. So the area is 30 and the perimeter is 30. This is the perfect triangle. It's like a portal. And this is known as the, the portal of time. So the two pyramids that are standing atop this Jed plateau that references God realization and the name Jed, the two pyramids were made of granite casing stone, rose granite specifically, because it was 55% quartz crystal content. And these two pyramids are exploded out hundreds of meters by huge blocks. And I'll show you the video for this in just a moment. And they both match exactly what an esoterica is considered the philosopher's stone, the achievement of hemi-synchronization of how we think and perceive the world. 
So using both hemispheres of the brain, the, the pyramid with the steeper slope angle represents the pineal gland, and the pyramid with the equilateral triangle represents the pituitary gland. And those two inside your brain through breathing techniques can be made to touch each other, just like Adam is touching God's finger, right, in the Sistine Chapel illustration of the mural on the ceiling. So I believe that this was actually the Tower of Babel, as it sits in the place that was known as Babylon, and that what we consider today as Babylon uh, is just a Mesopotamian town, None of the ziggurats were close to the size. Now, put this in perspective. If you're standing on the Giza Plateau, because the Jed Pyramid, the larger of the two, is 300 feet tall, and it's 300 feet higher, its peak would reach to 600 feet. The Great Pyramid reaches only to 481. This would have been 120 feet higher than the Great Pyramid. Imagine how colossal that would look. With a 60-degree slope angle, that would look unbelievable. And remember that the Great Pyramid was already recognized as the highest building in the world for, you know, at least 4,500 years, if you believe the dynastic story, and probably well over 10,000 years, if you believe any of the other alternative stories. So this building would have stood way higher than the Great Pyramid. And of course, if you really wanted to build a tower to heaven, you wouldn't build it on a lesser elevated you know, elevation. You would build it on one of the higher elevations. So I'm really excited to share this with you because I think this is a story that uh, is going to really defy our understanding of, of history and, and really change a lot of things because, you know, we're starting now finally to understand our true history and our true nature. This is fascinating because you're saying this may be the actual location of the Tower of Babel of Babylon, not in Mesopotamia, but here in Egypt, north of what's modern day Cairo. Are you seeing this guy walking up the hill? Yep, I can hear it too. Right, very easily. So that's Giza off in the distance. And then you can even see the Step Pyramid. Right. That's the Great Pyramid, right? That's the Great Pyramid on the left, yep. It's like that. Now, first of all, look at all these blocks. See all these giant blocks out here? Mm -hmm. These were all rose granite exploded from this pyramid. How did it get all the way out there? I mean, look at the size of these things. This is like the most <laughs> unresearched place that I know of in all of northern Egypt. Then also, right to the front of the pyramid on the diagonal of it is a smaller pyramid that I mentioned, the same as the dollar bill. So you're literally looking down on the pyramid because... Even though only a, you know less than a third of this pyramid still remains, you're still at a higher elevation. So, I mean, you see these blocks? These are big blocks. They're all rose granite. It's unbelievable. And then this is the one, and this is the casing stones are missing off this too. There are still some left. But, um, and, and, and this is the one that's got the 67.4 degree angle, right? along the front and also matches the dollar bill. The number of blocks is matching the dollar bill exactly on the front side of this. You on know, that little pyramid this arrow right is. There. Yep, on this little pyramid. This little pyramid was so steep that it stood 103.7 feet high. So these are two pyramids that look down on the Giza complex. And this is Abu Rawash, right? Abu Rawash, yes. Now, is this also near... Um, Zawa al Arian, I believe it's called. Um, it's another inverted pyramid. Muhammad calls it Egypt's Area 51. No, it's not. That's on the military base. That one's on the military base. They won't let you. They won't let you there. But that's is that nearby, kind of? Because I know that's north of the Giza pyramids. Yes, it's. But I think it's uh, north. It's to the north, more to the northwest, but kind of in between these, right? It's so fascinating, yeah, what's north that, like you said, is barely researched because that other pyramid that the Muhammad refers to as Egypt's Area 51, he talks about how that's also got the uh, word Stargate, Saba, basically embedded into it. Yeah, he told me that. Yeah, he, his name of his company is Saba, 
saboteur. So, <laughs> which I was like, saboteur, that's a great name. The saboteurs. <laughs> well, this is groundbreaking stuff. I mean, if you're saying that the Tower of Babel may have been right here, uh, literally an eye view of the Great Pyramid of Giza. That's what I believe. And the evidence is mounting in this direction. Biblical scholars have always believed that there was something wrong with this story about being in Mesopotamia. And I think this is actually a true example of, of whitewashing history, uh, which I think is really problematic. I never thought I would say such a thing, to be honest, right? But I think that's exactly what's happened in this particular case. Maybe what the reference is to confounding languages, maybe there was a period of time where we have higher frequency. And during that period of time, we had access to telepathy. And then as the earth moved into the cycle of more of an iron age, then we lost our ability to practice telepathy. Do you have any questions, first of all, on this whole Tower of Babel thing? Because it's it's so fascinating that this one, was all missed. One uh, thought I had about Nimrod, I can't remember which Hebrew word it is, but it basically says that uh, if you read it in the Hebrew, that Nimrod became a gibor or a giborim, which in in Hebrew is closely related to the word nephilim, which if you're looking into Genesis 6, 4, you know, these were basically this hybrid race. Uh, many would call them giants. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, Nimrod, I believe his name also means builder of cities, mighty warrior. Um, again, there's a lot of theories out there that he might have been even some kind of uh, hybrid in, in because of that word gibberim, which is closely related to Nephilim. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think he has achieved a level of, you know, probably enlightenment or something that was closer to like a god man. And he's immortalized. You know, in different traditions in Hungary, for example, they celebrate Nimrod. They say that he received his bow and arrow from God himself. So if we look also at the time of Jesus, this is a map from the time of Jesus when Jesus fled into, into Egypt to escape the extermination order, right, for the firstborn male children that was issued by King Herod, right? And there's no Cairo, but you've got Mahdi, which is calendar and Babylon. So Babylon today is still, that's still called Babylon there. Why we automatically assumed that Babylon had to be somewhere else is really kind of mind blowing. Now, this is the map that I mentioned by Fra Mauro and the one I found in Florence. And if you look, a couple things stood out to me. <laughs> Number one, here's Egypt looking at it from the different orientation. Right. So this is north and this is south. Right. Right. But you see the river, the tributary is basically emptying into the Mediterranean and it's called Egypto. And you can see the pyramids here, which I'll come back to in a moment. But you've got the name of the river is Gion. It's not Nile. And this map goes back to when? 1457. So this is pre Christopher Columbus. Wow. So. Remember, the Tower of Babel is supposed to have been built next to the Gihon River by Babylon, which was also established by Nimrod. And now the other thing I noticed is that there are five pyramids here. One, two, three, four, five. Now, that's also interesting because there was a French explorer who, in the 18th century, drew out uh, illustrations of there being four pyramids in Giza. So where's the missing pyramid? I mean, I can't imagine that he just like added a pyramid for fun. You know, so there's, right. there's, uh, this is what got me thinking after I saw this map in the first place. I'm like, what is this all about? And then I did research and found that Josephus and Herodotus, both the big famous scholars from, you know, antiquity, both said that the Gihon River was the name of the Nile. I mean, the, this was the Kushite kingdom here. It was never in Saudi. It was never in the black space where we can't even see because that's where Babylon would be today if we reckoned it. But the father of Nimrod was Kush. 
and supposedly the father of the Kushite kingdom. You see how this is all coming together now? Fascinating. When did you start connecting these dots? Was this was this just the last year? Yeah, just in the last uh, in the last year. And um, and did that map that you just showed me there that was kind of your first tip off? Yes, that first map was the first tip off. I started doing more research and just following my intuition. Another name for Gihon is Gison. Right, Babylon sits upon the river of Gison, sometimes clept Nile that cometh out of the terrestrial paradise. <laughs> out of the terrestrial paradise. That was supposed to be where the Garden of Eden was. That Babylon, the less, where the sultan dwelleth in the city of Cairo that is nigh beside it. Be great, huge cities, many and fair. Now, if we look in the, the story here, the first biblical mention of Nimrod, Table of Nations, he's described as the son of Cush, the grandson of Ham, great-grandson of Noah, as a mighty one in the earth, a mighty hunter before the Lord, just as you were describing. This is the Tower of Babel, right? And interesting that's even depicted here as having kind of a similar angle of ascent. So there are no tall ziggurats that are taller than the pyramids. The Hungarians named their constellation after the biblical Nimrod, great-grandson of Noah, mighty hunter before the Lord. And he was not a bad guy in the Hungarian story. He was he was a hero. Another thought I'm having is, you know, with what we're learning about, you know, the true purpose and function of the Great Pyramids, you know, likely some sort of holistic energy devices. And when we're talking about the Tower of Babel or Babel, as Muhammad Ibrahim, our Egyptologist author and tour guide, points out, you know, how Saba, or the word Stargate, is just mentioned all over Egypt in these pyramids. It paints the picture that the tower was so much more than just some some staircase up to the sky. I mean, it was it was yep. likely 3D. It was it was a portal of some sorts, I believe. These discoveries, especially surrounding Egypt and now Babylon, as you discussed, are just fascinating. And I'm really excited to get this information out and awaken more minds. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so great to spend time with you, my friend. And and you're definitely invited on a trip with me to Egypt. And not wait. And I can't wait to get on uh, the Orion app. We'll get that cooking. Totally. It's time. You know, it's all about freeing our voices. And that's why we built it. And and it's almost doing its own. You know, I didn't name it Orion. Someone on my team did. And I had no idea how the convergence would all come together. And now my next season of Codex is coming out in a couple of months. And it's epic. I mean, I actually give everyone a tour of the inside of the Great Pyramid through virtual reality. And it's totally real. It's it's amazing. <laughs> I had to get filmed in this box that looked like Vitruvian Man's box with 96 cameras on me and everything. It was nuts in three dimensions wow. and four dimensions for movement. And um, it's called Metatron Revealed. And the whole thing's about the story of Orion and the, and the hero's journey of Orion, which is just a representation of humanity itself. Going from this conqueror who is all about scarcity and control and power to learning that the most important aspect of being here is the realization that love trumps it all. That enlightenment is when the expression of love that you have supersedes and exceeds your desire for one objective truth and being right. An enlightened person doesn't have to be right. They choose love instead. Wow, well said. Well, for everybody watching, listening, follow Robert. Um, his website, robertedwardgrant.com. He's on Instagram at Robert Edward Grant. Any, anywhere else you want people to follow you and to keep up to date with everything? Uh, Codex, Codex Season 1, you can find on Gaia. It's also yes. on uh, Amazon Prime. Um, and, and Season 2 is coming out sometime this summer. Cannot wait. Well, thanks, Robert, so much for your time and wisdom and uh, courage. And we'll uh, talk soon. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.